ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners, please be advised that this conversation contains content that might be upsetting. Please use discretion when listening. Melissa Lukashenko is my guest today. Melissa is a Guri author of Bunjalung and European Heritage. Her novel, Too Much Lip, won Australia's biggest literary prize, the Miles Franklin Award, in 2019. Less well-known, perhaps, is the fact that Melissa has also won the game show, Millionaire Hot Seat, and back in the day, a bunch of karate competitions. Melissa's latest novel is called Eden Glassy, which was once the name given to colonial Brisbane, a blending of Edinburgh and Glasgow. Melissa's book is set both in the Brisbane of 2024 and in the same lands in the 1840s and 50s. This was a transformative moment in our history, an era of increasingly violent frontier warfare. But when many local Yagra people were still living on their own lands by their own law, hoping that the white invaders would hurry up and take ourselves back home. I found Eden Glassy a revelatory book. It changed the way I see the city I live in, and I'm so happy to be able to speak to you about it, Melissa, and about your own life. Hello. Hello. Let's start with two of the central characters in the novel, Mulan Yin and Nita. Tell mm. me something about them. Well, yeah, they're the um, the pivotal romantic pair in the 1850s. Uh, Mulan Yin is a young tribal man. He's come up from the Gold Coast area, Yugambeh land, to go through ceremony uh, in Wollongabba, which is now uh, on the south side of Brisbane. Um, he gets stuck in Brisbane and uh, is given into the care of the Yagra people and adopted by the Yagra headman and his wife. But his love and uh, the woman who becomes his wife is Nita. And Nita has grown up in a different fashion. She's been adopted by a white family, the Petrie family, and she's Christian. So the two of them uh, represent a meeting of the new Christian Aboriginal life and the coming out of a, a very tribal existence. And it's it's about how they fall in love, how they negotiate a future for themselves while colonisation is ramping up and everything is collapsing around them and what kind of life and love they can build. Mullinian is from saltwater country and he talks a lot about the Baragara. Tell mm. me about that and its meaning, its significance to him. Mm. Well, if um, if you're a saltwater person as I am, then uh, the Baragara, the, the ocean, is uh, is hugely significant. Uh, you know, for First Nations people all over the world, it doesn't matter if you're up in the desert or in mountainous country or, you know, in some Peruvian rainforest or, or on the saltwater of... Um, northern New South Wales, your country is the most exquisite and important and beautiful country on the planet. Um, that's without exception. And so he's he's living just away from his country. It's four days walk. Um, he's walked up with his father. And yeah, he's, he's torn between staying in Magungeon, Brisbane, and uh, getting together the resources to get himself a whale boat, a fishing boat. Uh, and marrying Nita and then going back home, going back to his people, going back to his country. So, you know, like probably fishermen all over the world, he's always thinking about fish and uh, being on the water. Well, when he's learning the way to be a man in his community, he catches a really big fish that mm. he's really proud of. Mm. How do mm. the adults around him react? Yeah, well, this is about um, aspirations of young men to be respected and recognised. So uh, he does hook a, a giant mull away. Uh, he's very skillful. You know, he's 15 mullet runs year old at this point. And he hooks this mull away. He's, he puts a lot of effort and endurance and patience into hooking this mull away. And he very proudly takes it back to camp and thinks he's going to be a big hero. And his fathers in particular, his, uh, his big father and his small father go, no, no, not happening, take it back quick. And they run back down to the... Um, ocean with this fish and they make him put the fish back in because of her significance and that's his first lesson in, or the first lesson that we see him experiencing in uh, putting his ego aside and sustaining life, which is an important part of his journey towards adulthood. And it's a lesson that, uh, like other lessons he learns in the book, 
isn't told explicitly, but one he's got to kind of glean from just putting his mind and, and experience to the test a little. Yeah, and that's a cultural um, behaviour that's very strong still. You know, it's um, so much of Aboriginal culture and law uh, persists. And one of them is the fact that you you don't ask for information. You use your eyes and ears and brain and you work it out yourself. And it's seen as lazy and inappropriate and rude to just ask to be told things and given things on a plate. It's like you, you've got a brain, you use it, you've got eyes and ears, you, you sit back and you observe and you work it out yourself. Makes it a bit tricky for me here as the journalist asking you questions, Melissa. Oh, I'm used to making allowances for white <laughs> Australians, it's okay. <laughs> The mutual obligations and connections in guru culture between humans and animals and between humans are, are beautifully drawn and, and contrasted, sometimes comically, sometimes tragically, with the way of life of these new arrivals. For instance, there's one night where Mullinian goes to cross the river, but the Kurilpa canoe that should be there has been stolen. And he thinks, you know, he can't even leave a canoe by the riverbank anymore because some white fella's just going to nick it. Yeah, you know, it's... Um all over the country, um, traditionally people would leave not just heavy things like grinding stones but smaller, more portable implements like nets and um, axes and all kinds of um, everyday objects would leave them, you know, where they belonged, near to their, their homes and, and go off and would very confidently expect that they'd be there when they got back a week or a month later because um, stealing is anathema in classical Aboriginal culture. You know, it's one of the main commandments of Aboriginal law is to not steal. You know, don't be greedy with what you do have and certainly don't go around stealing what doesn't belong to you. So, yeah, the um, the irony, the great irony of Australia is that the British came here and claimed to bring civilization. And I can't remember which of the um, Greek or Roman writers said it, but there's a famous quote that said they... Um, they made a wilderness and called it peace. And from a Guri point of view, that's what happened. You know, there was a, a paradise here, at least on the East Coast. It was a paradise with abundant water, abundant food, abundant fish, art, culture, sovereignty, governance, theology. And the British, you know, sailed in and, and proceeded to lay waste to it and call it civilization, which is, um, which is basically why I write. However, my task as, a, as an author is to bring love and joy and hope to the stories of what can arise out of that. Nita and Mullinian are fictional characters, but in the novel their lives are intertwined with this historical family, the Petrie family, who come from Scotland to Moreton Bay. How did you first discover the story of Tom Petrie? I think it was probably through reading the reminiscences of Tom Petrie, the, the memoir that his daughter compiled uh, when Tom was an old, old man and, you know, seen as a, a venerable citizen and someone, you know, one of the, the last remaining white people with memories of that colonial era. And, uh, yeah, that's a fascinating book and it was just begging to be fictionalised. Uh, it took me 20 years to do it because Petrie... Although he was reflecting as a very old man, and it was a first-hand experience of Brisbane in the 1840s, the 1850s, right through to the turn of the century, probably. I think he died in the very early 1900s, about the time my grandmother was born uh, north of Brisbane. So, yeah, just hearing it from the horse's mouth and hearing it from someone who actually understood Yagara culture and language very fluently. How did he understand that? What kind of connections did he have with local people, local landowners here? He had a very ordinary human connection because he was a young child in Brisbane. He had been born overseas and arrived here, I think, as a seven or eight-year-old. Uh, but from the age of seven or eight, he was running around with the Aboriginal kids, you know, playing with them, fishing with them, yarning with them, going for eggs in the bush, no doubt, and, you know, hunting. So he grew up very much bicultural. And, uh, you know, the Petrie family had to go and send for him quite often because he, he'd be staying in the camp when he should have been back home at Petrie by it and he just preferred to be sitting around the fire, you know, with his Aboriginal mates. 
So he was an initiated man. Um, as he grew older, he, he was put through Aboriginal law and he understood that when he went out and selected Marumba Downs on the Pine River, that there was a way to go about it that didn't didn't do, you know, immense damage to Aboriginal people and Aboriginal culture. He went with the permission of Dullapai, the head man from that area, uh, and Dullapai's nephew took him out. And he said, OK, young Tom, any of this land here from this ridge down to, I think it's Saltwater Creek in the Caboolture area, you can choose any of this land here. It sounds like an act of benevolence, but what was actually going on there was that Dalapai, a senior head man for the north side, was placing a sympathetic white man who understood Aboriginal law right next to the station, the white side station, where there'd been a lot of killing. And Dalapai was strategically ensuring that there was a safe place uh, in that area and that was also a stopping place for people travelling to and from the Bunya Mountains. And did Tom Petrie stay a kind of loyal friend to First Nations people over that course of his life? He was always close to Aboriginal people and younger men and women, but younger men uh, were loyal to him in an <laughs> extraordinary way, actually. It's uh, it's really telling. Um which is not to say that he always did everything the way blackfellas would have wanted him to. Uh, I think he grew more conservative as he got older. But leaving that aside for now, his workers at Marumba Downs, and I was horrified at first when I realised that the workers, his Aboriginal workers at Marumba Downs, were branded with a P. And I just went, wow, you know, this... Like this... cattle? Well... That's my, what I initially thought, but then I spoke to Gudger Kerry Charlton, who's a descendant of those workers, uh, and she pointed to her arm and said, yes, we had the P on our arm. And in conversation with her, we were talking about, well, was it a kind of a, a slavery symbol? And we, I, I've come to the conclusion that it wasn't. I think it was either an equivalent of a tribal marking where the men were proud to be associated with Petrie or alternatively, it could have been a protection because in the era we're talking about, 1850s, 1860s, the native police were just death squads running right wherever white pastoralists wanted blackfellas killed or rounded up and, and sent away, but very often killed unlawfully. And to have a P on your arm and to be able to say, no, I belong to the Marumba Downs, I'm one of Petrie's men, that would have been a, a kind of protection and a passport. So, you know, there's, as with all of this historical inquiry and cultural inquiry, you can't just stop at first impressions. If I just stopped and say, oh, Petrie was a bastard who branded his Aboriginal workers, that would have been only a tiny fraction of the story. You've got to dig deeper. And so I spent four years through the pandemic, through the bushfires, you know, through the floods, digging deeper. And, uh, yeah, it, there's so many fascinating stories. I could have written three Eden glasses. <laughs> what did you learn about the kind of place that, that Brisbane was in the 1850s? Um, one of the first things I learnt was how tiny it was. Like 1840 to 1855, you're talking about a white population of between one and maybe 3,000. It's a tiny, it's basically a village or a cluster of villages around the river, you know, North Brisbane, South Brisbane, Fortitude Valley. So the size of the place, I, I was really lucky because I lived in Tonga in 1997 and uh, Nukualofa was a, a small, dusty town a long way from the Western world. And so that gave me some insights into life in a a town where there's pigs, you know, running all over the the dirt roads, where people are living in villages and sometimes congregating in central areas, where the church is incredibly important. So I think that was a great gift to me as an author to have that experience. Uh, and it was a very violent place, you know. Again, this, this you know, Freud would have a field day. <laughs> the, the British rock up with their... I call them sufferers in the novel, you know, they rocked up with their convicts in chains, you know, treated as subhuman basically, as scum, as irredeemable scum. 
they're, you know, starved and whipped and just treated abominably and um, came here and started talking about the savages, <laughs> which you know, it's, it'd be laughable if it wasn't so funny. But being funny is, you know, a big part of the book too. It's, you can't, you can't write about this stuff and, um, and not find uh, veins of humour in, in the ridiculousness of it all. As white settlement was moving north in this period, Aboriginal people had been fighting to defend their lands. Tell me about Dundalee. Um, Dundalee was a, a feared and respected resistance leader, a very tall man. He was supposed to be about six foot seven um, from the Dalla people of the Jinnaburra Nation, which is in the Sunshine Coast hinterland. And um, he was appointed by the Bunya Mountains Bora, so the Aboriginal Parliament of the day. He was appointed as the man who would lead the resistance throughout South East Queensland, which at the time was called New South Wales by whites. And so he was a general, a general in the um, the defence of country. What happened in, to him in 1855 in the middle of Brisbane? Yeah, well, he'd been he'd spent several years leading the resistance, maybe as long as a decade. I can't quite remember, but um, for some reason, he was in Brisbane actually doing work. He was um, collecting wood or, or carrying lumber or something in the Fortitude Valley area, and uh, he was betrayed by um, some other Aboriginal people who alerted the white authorities that it was him. So he was captured, I think, sent to Sydney and and um, found guilty of they would have called it murder. And he was taken out in Queen Street before the assembled white and black soldier and civilian population of the town and hung. But the hangman was a bloke called Green and he was a um, a former convict himself. He was a convicted rapist. And uh, Green had misjudged the length of the rope that was needed for Dunderley and so Dunderley strangled horrifically in front of the whole town as the black population watched from the hill that the windmill stands on, which is one of the uh, prominent symbols of colonial Brisbane. And uh, that marked the beginning of the end of Aboriginal resistance in South East Queensland, I would argue. Not the end, but the beginning of the end. Dundalee was the last person publicly executed mm. in Queensland. I grew up here. Yep. I've never heard of him. No, well, <laughs> there you go. There's, you know, there's all sorts of reasons, economic, political, psychological, for these stories not to be told. You know, if if modern Australia can walk around pretending that it's it's innocent and uh, nothing happened here, nothing to see here, then you know that's got all sorts of implications. But since Marbo, Marbo has um, has changed things because now. Mainstream Australia has a framework to understand its colonial history uh, through. Uh, it's not a satisfactory framework because it doesn't achieve treaty or reparations, which I think is necessary for Australia to become more than the nation of thieves that Xavier Herbert called the place. But Marbo has kind of put a a platform on which to stand to say, well, Yes, there, there were always First Nations mob here. We've always been interacting with Europeans and others and there's a history here that can be told to everyone's benefit. My sense is that white Australia is maybe caught up with that concept, but the extent of violence that was on the frontier is something that is still not really filtered through more widely. Yeah, I just about fell off my chair yesterday. I was reading um, someone talking about being at school, I think in the 90s, and their teacher telling them, this is in New South Wales somewhere, telling them that they're so lucky that Australia was, you know, born as a peaceful nation, you know, a, a bloodless history. And I thought, bloody hell, are people still, were people still being told that in the 90s? And I, I guess they still are today in some places because, you know, ignorance is bliss, I suppose. But, you know, all, the, all of this history, all of the historical research, all of the thinking about what was done here, that was a starting point for me. And then after that, in Eden Glacier, we had to say, well, who are the characters who are going to bring this to light? But more than bring it to light, because it's not a history book. You know, I'm not a historian. 
I'm someone with a fascination with story and with the past as well as the present and the future. I put just as much, if not more, effort into constructing a a yarn that was gripping and funny and I hope heartbreaking. Eden Glassy swaps, as I mentioned, between these two time periods, between the you know, the mid nineteenth century and now. Is that kind of how you walk through the world, Melissa? That sort of double historical view? Yeah, I think um I think all First Nations people do, and I imagine historians do as well. But yeah, um, we we are always, you know, wandering around um, thinking what what game animals would have been farmed here, what what fish could you have caught here, what songs were sung here, what what do those cliffs at Kangaroo Point, you know, that's where the rainbow serpent slithered through to the bay, and. Uh, you know, you see the abseils <laughs> on the cliffs there and climbing up and they are climbing up that big snake slithering track, things like that. So, yeah, that's very natural and normal for all Aboriginal people, I think. And then the other thing, yeah, I had to have a triple vision in the book because I had to look at the colonial era and what, what was life like then, what was work like, you know, what was what was love like. What would Nita as a Christianised Aboriginal girl living in a Scottish family in this small, dusty outpost of empire, what would she have asked herself about Mullinion? And and so I had a reflecting at one point, you know, had Mullinion ever seen a piano? You know, had he ever been in a church? All these kinds of questions about what was fairly normal to her, but what was completely abnormal to him. And he's got this um, this fear of entering the Petrie house it's pretty unusual for Aboriginal people to be invited into a white person's house anyway, and in parts of Queensland still is. You know, I was talking to my mate from Palm Island this morning and um, I remember when uh, we were young together and we were at university at Griffith and uh, she was telling me that she'd never been inside a white person's house until she went to university, you know. So having to cast my mind back to 1855 and think, well... What would Mullinian think about these very straight walls in this in this straight edged square box that the Petries lived in as opposed to the soft round room that is a, an ompi? You know, it's it's a great joy and privilege of a of a writer to be able to spend time daydreaming about this kind of thing and it's the task of the writer to to bring that to an audience in a way that's surprising and um, revelatory, as you said. This is your seventh book, Eden Glassie. Give me a sense about what was going on in your own life as you were writing this book. (laughs) Oh, God. I think it's Barbara Kingsolver says um, in one of her great works that when you're an author, you just, with the first draft, you just put your head down and you hoe till the end of the row, by which she means you, you chip the weeds out and you chip and you chip and you chip and you work and you work and you don't look up until that first draft is done because writing first drafts is like pulling teeth. It really is. Um, it's no fun at all. And then after you've got your first draft, it's just brilliant because you get to go back and improve it, you know, time after time after time. And that's the fun part for me. And were you living in Brisbane or where were mm, you? Yeah, yeah, I've been in Brisbane for a few years now and uh, that was important. I, I, I think I had to be in Brisbane to write this book. What I often do is I, I've moved around quite a lot in my adult life and uh, what I often do is I live in a place for a few years and then I'll move away and I'll write about where I have been living. Just by coincidence, that's what has happened. But, yeah, with Brisbane I walked, you know, along the river, I... I walked to the CBD, a, a fellow called Peter Eady, who's a amateur historian here, he showed me where the Wheat Creek still runs underneath the buildings in the CBD. And uh, Wheat Creek is uh, what gave Creek Street its name, and that's the creek where Tom Petrie's brother, I think Walter, drowned as a uh, a young bloke because uh, he fell off this um, kind of makeshift bridge and fell into the water and drowned. And Mary Petrie, the mother of these boys and the wife of uh, grandfather Andrew Petrie, who was called the father of Brisbane, yeah, Mary knew she had a premonition that they would find him in water and he'd just gone missing and they couldn't find him for two days or three days and eventually they found him under this 
makeshift bridge in shallow water where he'd been knocked out and drowned in the creek. Yeah. When in your own life, Melissa, did you start learning about your Guri identity? Well, I think I'm always learning. You know, it's, uh, I was raised by my mother who was raised by her grandmother with her extended family and mum's granny was a child slave. So I'm, you know, only my mother is separating me from the experience of Aboriginal slavery in uh, the 1800s in Queensland. Having said that, mum was very quiet about her Aboriginality and I just thought every, no, I just thought human experience involved some people having dark olive skin and curly brown hair and other people just popped out white and red-haired and that was no, nothing unusual. But um, as a young teenager, uh, someone from outside the family said to me, you're Aboriginal. And I said, no, I'm not. And they said, yeah, yeah, I'll go home and talk to your parents. And I did. Yeah, about that time, mum fessed up. What was that conversation like? Very brief. Well, what she did was she took out a photo. We've only got two, no, three photos of Granny Christina and um, she put out put one of them on her dresser. And I said, who's that Aboriginal woman? And she said, oh, that's my grandmother. And I went, oh, that's why we've all got brown skin and curly hair. Right. And then I just, you know, being a teenager, I just turned my attention back to karate because that was what I was interested in at the time, karate and, um, I suppose, boys to some extent. <laughs> On air, online, and on the ABC Listen app. This is Conversations with Sarah Konoski. You can subscribe to the Conversations podcast. To find out more, just head to abc.net.au slash conversations. Melissa, you were saying that it was when you were 14 that your mum started sharing your Guri heritage with you. Why wasn't that something that she had spoken to you about before? Well, she was she was raised to um, assimilate, you know, to to survive in the, the world that she was born into. Mum very nearly starved to death as a child in, in the Gympie area. She was born in 26... So she was a very small child during the Depression and the family were very poor. And um, if it wasn't for the fishing fleet kind of donating a mullet to Granny Christina every so often and going out for bush food, you know, living on bush oysters and, and you know, whatever they could scrounge, my family probably would have starved. Mum said she nearly starved to death. So proclaiming yourself Aboriginal was, was kind of not top of their agenda. It was um, it was surviving and passing as white is a has been a survival tool for colonised people all over the world, which is something I was ashamed of for a long time. Um, but I think I've just about let go of that shame and, and just accepted that I've had privileges in my life that have arisen out of mum assimilating. But I have reversed that process in my lifetime and I'm uh, very much part of the Aboriginal well, the Guru community, and um, I think as a Guru, I dream as a Guru, I live as a Guru, and I'm very much the better for it. And and Mum, you know, she she put a veneer of whiteness over her life in order to survive and in order to keep her kids apart from anything else. But you know, she married a very violent Russian man, and her life was about survival on many levels. But there was an Aboriginal person underneath that and I glimpsed that. I only glimpsed it occasionally. In what sort of way? Um, well, the most obvious way that was ongoing was Mum's exceptional ability with plants. She had an encyclopedic knowledge of plants, even though she only went to about grade three of school and then had to leave to be a domestic. She was always a very curious woman, very, very intelligent woman, always learning and uh, she knew the common names and the Latin names for just about every plant that grows 
in Brisbane, I reckon. And she passed on a lot of that knowledge, but it wasn't in the European sense alone. It was, uh, you know, little little things like each of my, me and each of my siblings were given a tree. We were told that's your tree, that's your special tree growing up. And it wasn't, you know, no one made a huge deal about it. And it was just, oh, yeah, that's my tree, that one, oh, that's my brother's tree, this is someone else's tree. And it was only decades later that I realised that that's an Aboriginal practice, you know, and probably mum didn't get to bury our placentas under the trees, but nevertheless the practice persisted. Things like that. Tell me about the place you grew up, your house, Melissa. What did it look like? Oh, God. (laughs) I got in big trouble from mum once for for revealing that it was a converted chook shed. (laughs) She was horrified that people would... Would, would come to know this. I think it was actually a converted pig shed because it was long, you know, like an industrial pig shed. Um, Dad's family uh, had fled the Russian Revolution and come to Brisbane via Shanghai. And um, then my, gra- my Russian grandmother had put my father and his older brother into an orphanage in Brisbane to escape her extremely violent husband, who was a real piece of work. And then after 12 months, she went and got the boys back and she ended up marrying a Czech man who was my dad's stepfather and he was a pig farmer who... um, And actually, I just made a connection then. It's funny what you don't realise. He farmed pigs out at Rochdale and I grew up um, on a bit of the farm that was carved off for Dad. But he used to sell the produce from the pig farm at Wollongabba. So, of course, Wollongabba's significant and that's probably a part of the reason why I set the pull and pull at Wollongabba. How many sheds were there up around it in your place, Melissa? Oh, God. My father was a bush carpenter. He could um, he could fix anything mechanical and he could build sheds like there was no tomorrow. I think when he died, we counted something like 17 sheds <laughs> on the on the three acres that um, the Russians had carved off for him because he was clearly not going to be a success in life. He was a... I don't know, I heard my grandmother put it. She said he does not want for originality of character. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, <laughs> quite, quite the phrase to talk <laughs> about your son. And she was right. He was mad as a cut snake and also an extremely violent man himself, I should add. But he wasn't violent to me and um, he uh, he built sheds. He... He was good with um, the land too. He, you know, they both came from farming backgrounds, my parents, and uh, mum could grow anything. She could make a star picket flower. <laughs> and we grew most of what we ate when I was growing up. You know, we had pumpkins, we had beans, we had tomatoes, we had rosellas, we had pawpaw, we had everything. I think the only things that we bought were probably bread and meat and milk and uh, everything else was the sweat of your brow. Tell me about you and horses. When did you first fall in love with them? Mm, I couldn't remember a time when I wasn't in love with horses. When did you start riding then? Um, oh, look, I used to jump on any unbroken horse that was in the vicinity. Any unsuspecting <laughs> yeah. horse. Well, there was a paddock down the back of um, where I grew up and uh, at one stage someone had some horses on adjustment in there and I remember there being this young... Um, creamy coloured gelding, I think it was. It was probably only a yearling or something and I managed to clamber on top of it as a bloody seven or eight year old and of course fell straight off again. Yeah, if if there was a a horse riding past, if there was a pony to be looked at, if there was a picture of a horse, I was just obsessed, completely obsessed. And I was thinking about this the other day and thinking, you know, when I think about my working life, the first paid job I had was um, detailing motorbikes in uh, Moss Street in Slacks Creek at 15. But really the first job I got paid for was I did it on the sly. I, um, a kid in my class at school had this unrideable green horse. Green means untrained. And her parents found out that I was good with horses and so an invitation was offered to me that, you know, could I come and ride this unrideable horse for her for five bucks a pop. Did and, your and, mum think about that oh, mum proposal? Just, mum thought it was... A sh- the worst idea she'd ever had absolutely forbade me from doing it. So what I did was I jumped on my pony, rode my pony flat strapped to this girl's place, rode her horse, got the five bucks, galloped home and didn't tell mum that I was doing it. <laughs> so, yeah. so you had your own horse as well? From 10 I had a um, an old 
pony from up the road was um, delivered to me probably so I stopped climbing on all the unbroken horses in the neighbourhood. You mentioned that your parents hadn't had much formal education. Your mum had had to leave school when she was still young. What kind of value did she place on you getting that kind of formal schooling? Yeah, well, mum could see very clearly that education was the way out of poverty. Dad had more. Um, Dad went to state high. I'm not sure if he graduated or not, but he um, he certainly had more schooling than mum as a, a, man, a Russian with white privilege. You know, there were books with Cyrillic characters in, in the family home, which were just sort of lying around dusty and unread. But the, uh, the Russians certainly came with some kind of an educational background. Yeah, but mum in particular, there was no skipping school when I was a kid. You know, the idea of not going to school every day was just unthinkable. Were you as enthusiastic as she <clears> was? Oh... <throat> uh, I was good at the the academic side of things. I wasn't good at the social side of things. So, um, yeah, I had mixed feelings about school. Actually, I hated high school. I didn't really pay much attention to high school. I was obsessed with karate from the age of 14. How did you first get introduced to karate? Well, I was very fortunate that there was a karate school about three kilometres from home. Yeah, close enough to walk if I was feeling enthusiastic and close enough to get dropped off. And uh, I was starting to get a bit... Oh, just a bit silly when I was 13 and um, just starting to kind of push the boundaries and look like I might get into trouble. And a friend of the family said, oh, you want to get that girl into martial arts? And so, again, mum took me along to karate and it was uh, a perfect fit for me. Why? Oh, because I got to punch and yell and uh, feel strong, feel powerful and belong, belong in a way that I hadn't belonged before. Punch and yell, but it's so strictly controlled at the same time. You know exactly Mm. what you've got to do and how to do it in karate. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've never been afraid of hard work and it was very hard work. You know, I I trained for years. I trained for 10 years and got my black belt after about three years. What was your teacher like in karate? (laughs) Well, um, became a bit of a father figure for a while, but he was an ex-copper who um, was a cop in the Joe era, but he'd had the intelligence to get out pretty fast. But there was a lot of serving police at the at the academy where I trained. And, uh, you know, I've heard it from the horse's mouth about them laughing about beating people up and what it was like to be a copper in the 1982 Commonwealth Games protests, you know, on the, on the police side of the barricades as opposed to the Aboriginal side of that protest. Yeah, so interesting. Um, very formative years. Did you like competing? Yeah, I loved competing. It wasn't a club that was focused on competition. That was a, a traditionalist kind of club and it was about doing your kata, getting your forms right, training hard and putting your ego aside, learning to not focus on yourself but focus on the training. And once a year we'd compete in the Queensland Karate Championships and, uh, yeah, yeah, I loved that. You made your mum happy and yourself happy and you finished school and went on to university. Mentioned motorcycle detailing. What else, what other sorts of jobs were you doing to support yourself while you were studying? Painted a lot of houses. What's Uh, what's your trick? What's my trick? (laughs) I don't do it anymore. (laughs) That's the trick. Make enough money to pay someone else to do it. Um, No, the trick is to remember to wear a mask and earmuffs if you're sanding a Queenslander, um, which I didn't do a lot of. I probably inhaled a great deal of lead paint when I think about it. But yeah, and um, cutting in, you always got to cut in and then you fill in once you've done the outside edges, the tricky bits. So do the tricky bits first and then do the easy bits. (laughs) But I interrupted you, sorry, you were saying you had a partner. Yeah, he was a house painter and um, so I learned how to... uh, how to sand and how to fill and how to paint and how to carry bloody trestles around. I tell you, I was so fit back then. I was very strong, very fit, and I could move a four-metre trestle on my own, hoik it around on my shoulders. You were involved in setting up a prison advocacy group called Sisters Inside. Was this around that time or how did that No, start? that was a bit later. That was after university. I'd done a degree in public policy and economics at Griffith, which changed my life. And gone away to Canberra and done a short stint in Canberra and decided that wasn't for me and 
went back to Eagle Bay because I thought living at Eagle Bay, painting houses was preferable to um, being an intern in the federal government under Hawke. Possibly a mistake when I look back, but anyway, I don't think I ever would have <laughs> stayed very long as a, a desk worker. I'm too, um, I don't have the persistence. My eldest brother, I didn't know growing up, I only met him once or twice as a child and then we reconnected when I was about 24 maybe. And that was because he'd spent the majority of his life up to that point in and out of prisons in Australia and New Zealand. And um, also my father had banished him from the family and so mum had to only have contact with him in secret. So I had this kind of secret brother who was a a crim and that was part of the reason why when I heard there was a a meeting to form an organisation or do something about women in prison in... um, in my early 20s that I thought, yeah, that's that's something I'll definitely be interested in. But I was, I was already a lefty. I was a feminist and I knew how important jail is in damaging and diminishing Aboriginal lives. So, yeah, went along to a, a house at West End, met half a dozen other women who were already doing prison activism. Deb Kilroy had not long got out of jail and uh, we sat down and two hours later we were sisters inside. And what stands out to you when you think back to that time, either particular women or experiences you had? How does it stay in your memory? I think about the old Bogger Road women's jail. My brother had been locked up in the men's, you know, done quite a long time in the men's, which was a horrific, a horrific jail, you know, very old, very, very haunted, very gruesome. And the women's, when I was going there, it was, um, it was more modern than the, than the male wing. Yeah, just going in and sitting with the the lifers, the long termers, because they were the they were and are the the women inside who get to um, be the committee on the inside and have some measure of control over what sisters does. <laughs> I remember one time I went in and I was wearing these purple socks, phantom motif on them, and one of the long termers said, "Oh, I like those socks." And so under the eyes of the guards, sort of didn't scrutinise us all that much, but there were guards coming and going sort of in the distance and then there would have been CCTV, but we were having this meeting and throughout the course of the meeting uh, I managed under the table to remove my shoes and socks and put my shoes back on and pass the socks to one of the long-termers. So she ended up with my phantom socks. I don't know what the penalty for smuggling (laughs) phantom socks in is. You married and had two kids and and moved around with your then-husband's work to Tonga, as you say, and and other places. But where in your heart did you always really want to live? Yeah, I had no interest in leaving Brisbane, you know. I was very much a Brizzy girl and uh, had just met all these wonderful new friends through the Sisters Inside crew when Bill's work required us to go back to Canberra. So we did probably three stints in Canberra over the the next 15-odd years and a stint in Tonga. But I wanted to... I wanted to be back in Guri country, which is south-east Queensland and northern New South Wales, stretching, you know, approximately from Bundaberg down to Grafton. But, uh, yeah, the river... The river here always has called me and, uh, you know, culturally as well as psychologically, you know, that's because I was born just down the road here on the bend of the river in the Marta Hospital and where you're conceived, where you're born and where your parents are from is really important to blackfellas. My kids um, did a lot of their growing up on Bunjalung country and I was forced through divorce to come away and live in Logan City where I could afford to live instead of um, the very gentrified and... uh, completely out of reach, coastal parts of Bunjalung country where I had been living. Uh, And these days I still spend a lot of time on Bunjalung country, but in the western section where it's more possible to have a life if you're not a cashed up advertising executive. In that period of your life after the divorce and you were living back at Logan, what did you decide to do to try to get a bit of cash? Yeah, well, um... There was a few lean years in there. Um, I bought it was probably the cheapest house in uh, the greater Brisbane area after my divorce with the settlement because I knew that if I had a mortgage, I probably would never write another novel. Uh, so I bought this cheap-ass house and 
I went back and I was doing some work for Sisters Inside again, you know, picking women up from prison and trying to find them housing and getting them their Centrelink payments and just generally making their lives a bit easier in the transition from jail to outside. Doing that and, you know, sort of plugging along, not really... I was treading water. I'd I'd published three novels by then and uh, I thought, well, this is all very well, but my ex-husband had one sale of the century when he was very young. I think he was about 23 and um, so young that when he, he had one and he went, he was living in Darwin and he went to the local, you know, Toyota dealership or something and, and started looking at cars and they didn't take him seriously because he was so young. And he says, yeah, I'll pay cash for that one. Thanks very much. I've got a big check here from yeah, yeah. Tony Barber. Exactly. <laughs> um, so it... It, uh, I think he had a maybe applied for millionaire hot seat. I thought, oh, bugger it, I'll, I'll apply for it. So <laughs> in the midst of working with women in prison and like scrounging around and trying to ignore the bloody ice addicts up the road, I got a phone call and said, do you want to go? Oh, and my father had just died too. It was like literally a week after my father had died. Do you want to go on millionaire hot seat? <laughs> I said, yep, sign me up. So I flew down to Melbourne and... Um, What's the process? you were you made up? How does what's the whole day that you're filming like? What do you remember? Um, well, you've done an initial selection process in your home city, and then um, you, yeah, you get flown down. You meet the other people. You have to say special subjects that you want to answer, no. or it's you anything. You do in the paperwork, um, which was their downfall because. <laughs> I don't know how stupid you'd have to be to to answer the question honestly where it says, what are your areas of weakness? It's like, oh, yeah, I'll tell you what I'm no good at and then you can ask me that for the last question. I don't think so, pal. You gained millionaire hot seat, Melissa Lukashenko. Yes. What, what did you put as your weakness then? Um, I put, I think it must have been science because I have a reasonable you know, general grasp of science and um, put literature or history or something for my area of strength. But yeah, I wasn't going to write down sport or something that I'm bad on. And <laughs> sure enough, the last question is, what is the scientific um, measurement for light? You know, what's the name of that? And there's the four options and I was staring at it and I didn't know the answer, but my daughter was in the audience and she knew the answer. You know, she's all of 16, but she knew the answer and she reckons she beamed it into my head. <laughs> Still claims the credit for that. What uh, is the answer? The answer is candela. And... Uh, <laughs> So I said Candela and walked out with a cheque for 50 grand. That's, that's <laughs> fantastic. It was pretty good, hey? <laughs> Did that make a big difference to life day to day? Oh, yeah, yeah, it made a huge difference. I gave some of it to my kids and um, probably bought a decent car. But, yeah, I had money in the bank for the first time in years and uh, that makes all the difference. What was the bigger buzz, that or the Miles Franklin? Oh, the Miles Franklin by a country mile. Absolutely. It was, um, you know, Millionaire Hot Seat was very good timing and fun and gratifying, but the Miles is just stratospherically different. So this novel, Eden Glassy, it's set, as we've said, between the 1850s and the 2020s. How are you feeling about this country at the end of 2023? Oh, that's a big question. I am worried about social cohesion. I think the logic of capitalism is ripping us apart and diminishing our humanity. You know, there's the, the homelessness and the the lack of decent housing for people to lead decent lives in is unprecedented in this era. You know, COVID exposed all kinds of rifts in the body politic that have always been there, but really laid that bare. So how I'm feeling about the country is, um, well, in a perverse way, I feel quite optimistic, actually. Why? Uh, yeah, why? That's a good question, isn't it? Maybe because I've just come back from the um, Newcastle blockade of the um, of the coal ships and I saw a kind of activism there and a determination of people that love the country to protect it and to take intelligent action. I think climate, the climate crisis, you know, the, the fact that we live on a boiling planet is going to actually upend things, not just in the environmental sense, but in the social and political sense. And if we're smart and, you know, we're homo sapiens, we're the thinking ape, 
allegedly, and I believe that we can, from this crisis, make a better future. And that's going to involve undoing a lot of things. It's going to involve a really clear analysis of how and why capitalism is failing us as societies and and what's next. What's next? It's It's not more coal. It's not more gas. It's not more selfishness. It's about very simple human values. And it may mean, in inverted commas, a lower standard of living. But I don't think a lower standard of living is living in a place where everyone is fed, everyone is housed, everyone is educated, everyone is clothed and everyone is connected. You know, if if we have to do that and it means that we have less access to material, flashy consumer goods, you know, I call that progress. And uh, I think we're going to arrive at that point. Well, at least that's my strong hope and that's what I'm going to work towards. What about the state of truth-telling and, I guess, truth-listening between First Nations and other Australians? Mm, yeah, well, there will always be people who are too defensive to be honest about what was done here, and that's just that's just the fact of it. You know, it was 200-odd years of trying to wipe First Nations out, and that failed. They failed to do it with poison. They failed to do it with guns. They failed to do it with infected blankets. They failed to do it with missions. They failed to do it through banning languages and stealing our children. So I think with all the challenges that we face, we are people with brains in our heads and we have eyes and ears and we have mouths and we're not going to be silenced. The days of if you're black, get back are behind us and I think the genie's out of the bottle and we will be heard and it's not not necessarily being heard in an oppositional way either but, you know, leadership from the societies that have been here for so long. You look at the bushfires, you know, the terrible bushfires of 2019 and the ones that have followed. We've got the ecological knowledge in our nations to prevent that kind of loss and destruction Look at the Murray Darling, you know, look at salinity, look at all these issues. Blackfellas have worked this stuff out over 100,000 years. So to me, the answers are self-evident. We take the the mother culture that has been here forever and we add on to it the things that the Europeans brought that are of value, like technology, and we make a decent future we build an Australia that works for everyone. Melissa, thank you so much for coming on to Conversations. Bogle bear, Jimbalo. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Sarah Kanoski. For more Conversations interviews, head to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.